Well, it's been two months, two whole months. And what an amazing two months they have been. Free. Free. They have been freed from Egypt. They never thought they would. It was a dream. It was one of those prayers you pray, kind of hedging your heart, thinking, I'm going to pray it, but I don't want to be disappointed. But God came through. And now they were free. And the way it happened, talk about just God, God in your face kind of stuff. The plagues, that Nile turning into blood, and all the other things that happened, it was undeniably God. They'd never seen anything like it. And then, when it actually came to leaving physical Egypt, their previous captors sent them away with gold. Tons of it on their wrists, around their necks, on their ears. They sent them away with gold. They'd never owned anything, let alone gold. And if that wasn't enough, they get to that Red Sea, questioning what's going to happen because the army's behind them, but it parts. And they walk, or run probably, <laughs> through this sea. Again, you can't even imagine in your wildest dreams what that would be like, but they've just done it. They get to the other side, head out, and now they have manna. What is it? I don't know what it is, but it fills you up. Slaves now with full bellies every day. They don't have to worry about food anymore. There is no one hungry. A million people in the middle of the desert and no one hungry. And when they get sick of that, meat. And not just a little bit of meat, tons, literally, tons of it flies in. Nothing like KFC. It's amazing. <laughs> then, water. They get to this river and it's bitter. They complain, ask God. Moses does his thing. It's sweet. Like that. They get to another spot. Again, no water. Moses hits the rock and water comes out. Just like that. God stuff in amazing physical happening. Like you just, you just can't deny it. Finally, they face their first battle. This motley group of slaves. They've been slaves for generations. They've never fought anything. They've cowered their entire life. Now they face the Amalekites. A fierce group of warriors, highly trained, highly skilled, highly organised, and like that. God comes in, the slaves win. That's a pretty big two months. But now, that two months is done and they are entering the heart of the desert, the desert of Sinai. And here we find them, and I'd invite you to turn to chapter 19 of Exodus, the second book of the Bible, chapter 19 of Exodus. Some of my texts will be on the screen, but we're kind of going through a fair chunk of text. I couldn't fit it all there. So I'd invite you, your Bibles, to turn to chapter 19 of Exodus. We find them camped at the foot of the mountain, Mount Sinai, now in the desert. And it is here in the desert that God makes his covenant with them. In the desert. In the desert, the land of in-between. Not Egypt, where they've come from, but not Canaan, where they're going. The land of in-between. The place of waiting, of wilderness. And we all have lands of in-between. I was talking to one of our young girls from Springwood family just the other day, last Sabbath, the Sabbath before, and just saying, I mean, I said, How, how's everything going? I'm in third year uni. And third year uni, it's no longer start of uni where it's all exciting and you're just starting something new. And graduation still seems a far way off. And third year is that 
hump here. I'm like, oh, it's never going to end. I can't face another assignment. Kill me now. Do I even want to keep going? You do. But it's that land of in between. It's hard. You're a parent. You raised your kids in the ways of God. And now they're all grown up. And it seems at this point in time they've forgotten both God even and you. Just caught up in their own lives. The land of in between. You've moved to a new area. Feeling God's leading. You get there. Start looking for work. Nothing. The land of in between. You committed yourself to a marriage or a relationship once. And now that person has left. Just like that. And you're left to face the wilderness. The land of in between. Retirement. Work is over. But the celebration has been come and gone. The three-month holiday hasn't eventuated. And that you're just not sure where you fit anymore. That niche hasn't been found. The land of in-between. The land of in-between. The wilderness of life. From an outsider's perspective, they vary in intensity. But when you're in it, when you're facing that desert stretched before you, it feels intense because you're the one in the wilderness. And it is here that God makes his covenant with his people. He solidifies his relationship with them here. He calls them to be his people, to follow his ways, and promises them blessing if they choose to follow him. God gives them the Ten Commandments as well as other laws for Moses to instruct them. And initially, unlike, I don't know, the, the, the kids' stories I grew up with, they don't come in tablet form straight away. It's not just like, get to Sinai, Ten Commandments in tablet form, bam. No, no. As I was studying this more, shame to say, only it really occurred to me in detail now, God doesn't just give them the signed papers. He actually goes through a process with them. He, in, he invites them. He calls Moses up to the mountain and he verbally gives, lays it out to them, asking them to be his people. And only when they come to him and say yes, that's when the actual tablet solidifying of the process happens. So we are in verse 19, I mean chapter 19, sorry. I've got to find where I'm up to in my notes. 19, verse 2, and we're going to read. After they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. And just an aside, isn't that a beautiful thing? God rescued them prior to this covenant. He busted them out of Egypt before they agreed to anything like this. Just like Jesus, you know, he died for the whole world first. And then it's up to us whether we want a covenant with him. But he does the rescue work first. And I thought, it's a beautiful parallel. Anyway, so Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. And the people all responded together, 
We will do everything the Lord has said. They agreed. And so, at this, God starts the process of covenant. And I'm paraphrasing quite a few chapters now, so we're not going to read them all. The people are told to consecrate themselves. Get ready. Moses is called back up to the mountain. And there is darkness, smoke, thunder and lightning. So it's, it's pretty obvious again that something's happening. It's not just, you know, nothing now. They still can see God speaking. God says it all again. And then I invite you to turn to me to chapter 20, verse 22. Yes, we've paraphrased a lot. But God is clear and, and reiterates something specific. I've got it up here. Tell the Israelites this. And this is after already the Ten Commandments, everything's been gone through. It's like he, he just wants to emphasize, tell the Israelites this. You have seen for yourselves that I have spoken to you from heaven. It's been obvious, you've heard it. Do not make for yourselves any gods to be alongside me. Do not make for yourselves gods of silver or gods of gold. You've heard me speak. You know I'm God. Don't put anything alongside me now. It was a relationship of trust that God wanted with them. Something that went beyond the tangible and the physical. He made it clear to them that he was there. But then he said to them, you have to walk in trust with me. Don't go trying to create physical and tangible all the time. I want you to trust me. I spoke to you from heaven. Hold on to that. Believe that. Don't keep demanding physical manifestation. You know, it's in the desert experiences of life, the land of in-betweens, that God wants to establish a relationship of trust with us too. It's in those places that trust is really forged. He says to us, hold on. Don't rely on what you can see. Don't look for idols. Don't put your, your trust in things other than me. Trust in me. What I have done in you in the past, what I have said to you, what I have told you in my word, hold on to that. Hold on to me. You know, it's interesting, just looking at the Old Testament, God was so strong with them on no idols that even the way the tabernacle was set up, you had the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was kept, the altar, burnt sacrifice, was nowhere near that. It was outside of the tent, out in the courtyard, almost as if there God was saying, no, no, don't make that, that Ark is not me. It's not an idol. You don't burn anything in front of it. They'd be tempted to do it because pagan nations did that. Even today, you know, you, you go to an idol and there's a little thing happening there. No, he's like, I want you to know that I can see what you do from where I am in heaven. Don't, don't make an idol. I thought that was pretty cool. God was insistent that his people have faith to understand that he saw what they did for them in heaven. Anyway, Moses, he's up the mountain, a whole lot of information is given and we're not going to read all that to you, there's a lot so I'd invite you to turn with me to 24 now. As you turn over, you'll see there's protection of property, social responsibility. There's a lot that is explained to them. But then we come to chapter 24, and this is where the covenant is going to be confirmed. Exodus chapter 24. The covenant is confirmed with burnt offerings, and the people repeat again, everything the Lord has said, we will obey. Then, verse 12. This is chapter 24, verse 12. The Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and stay here, and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and commandments I've written for their instruction. Then Moses set out with Joshua his aide, 
And Moses went up on the mountain of God. He said to the elders, Wait here for us until we come back to you. Aaron and Hur are with you, and anyone involved in a dispute can go to them. So Moses goes up, but he is up there, away from the camp, 40 days, longer than they expect. And here we have them entering like a micro wilderness experience within the wilderness experience as a whole. They're in the desert 40 years. This is a 40 day thing. He's away longer than they expect. And while he's away, they start to question. They have just had this amazing experience with God. Physical manifestation, sincere commitment made, and then, well, nothing. They get up, pick up the manna, cook it, clean, go to bed. Get up, pick up the manna, cook it, clean, go to bed. And it goes on. 40 days, not what they expected. I can imagine they expected they were hoofing it to Canaan. They've made the commitment, get the tablets, run. God doesn't lead them the way they expect. That nothingness. Life as usual. With no end in sight. They don't know how long he's up there for. We know he was up there 40 days, but they don't know. And that's the thing too. Their leader seems absent. This man who's brought them all the way from Egypt now seems absent. He went up the mountain, they haven't heard from him since. But it's significant, I think, that though he seems absent, he's not. He's actually up there sorting everything out, getting the tablets, meeting with God, getting further instructions on how to build the tabernacle. He's up there doing stuff for them, but he seems absent. He feels absent. And that's the point, isn't it? When the feeling goes. The experience that we all face sooner or later. You know, we meet Jesus for the first time. Nothing will ever be the same. He's so real, amazing, incredible high. You commit your life to him, you're baptised. Yeah. But then at some point, life does become a little bit more usual. The feeling is not as intense. And you're left wondering, what did I do? Where did he go? Is he still there? Was it real? I don't know. Have I done something wrong? You know, we have an amazing crossroads experience. God clearly tells us, go this way. And you start walking, and you keep walking, and then suddenly you're like, huh, oh, well, I'm walking. I don't feel that amazing closeness anymore, and I haven't heard from him since on that level. Am I still meant to be going this way? Perhaps I didn't hear properly right back here. I don't know. Did it happen? Hmm. Where did the feeling go? That's the land of in-between. Perhaps we have an amazing answer to prayer. One of those, oh, God is so real, praise God. And then life goes on and you pray some other prayers that are quite sincere and heartfelt. And God says, not yet or no. And you're left feeling, did he hear? Was that real? Did I imagine it? What happened? The land of in-between. And it is in the land of in-between, this nothingness of in-between, that cows seem so attractive. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but I love cows. Look, I just want to ask a question here. Who here has spoken with cows, has actually talked to cows? Hands up. Don't be shy. Oh, praise God, there's a few people out there. Yeah. And the rest of you, look around. Just keep your hands raised. Yes. 
These are the people you need to talk to if you can't talk to me. Cows. Cows are these amazing animals that if you walk into a paddock and start talking, they all, as one, turn their heads and look at you. Like, you can have a whole herd of about 50 giving you their full attention. And I have to confess that at some points in my life, specifically when I was a young teen, I was struggling a bit, not knowing where I fit, didn't really have anyone in my life at that stage. I drew great comfort from the fact that 50 cows was talking to me. Well, not talking, they didn't talk. But they were listening. <laughs> yes, no, I wasn't on drugs. They were listening to me. <laughs> cows, the attraction of cows. It felt like they were listening to me. Unfortunately, they weren't. It just seemed like that. And that's also the issue with cows. Seems like they're there. Seems like they're giving you what you need. Not really. Golden calves are not much that are not much different. Now we're now in Exodus 32. Flip over again. Exodus chapter 32. Here we have. Oh, it's a long way over. Here we have the Israelites now suffering that nothingness. Moses is up there. Life goes on. And this is what they say. Chapter 32. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron. Now this they gathered phrase just seems quite normal there, but when you look it up in Hebrew, there's only three other places in Moses' writings that that particular phrase is used. They're all in numbers, and they all have negative connotations, as in, in opposition. The people gathered in opposition. And from the context of this story, I think it fits quite, quite well here. So when I read this, I'm convinced, at least, that it's a gathering of opposition. Moses, so long in coming down the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. Something we can see. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. We don't know what has happened to him. Aaron answers them, I think in appeasement, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. Perhaps, I'm just thinking, there's no guarantee on this, perhaps in his mind he's saying, if I ask them for so much, all this gold that they like, maybe they won't go any further. Maybe I've held them off. Perhaps he was thinking that. But, verse 3, So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. Plan gone. So he took what they handed him, made it into an idol, cast in the shape of a calf, cow, fashioning it with a tool. And then, where are up to? Uh, yeah. And then they said, the people said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. It doesn't seem like they've suddenly forgotten that God brought them out, out of Egypt. It would actually be implausible. It was only two months ago and it was pretty big. But they've chosen to represent him with an idol, additional insurance kind of thing, something they can see, something that will go before them, but the very thing he'd forbidden. And this next bit is classic. Aaron knowing the whole thing is wrong, I believe, sees his chance for a major cleanup. They've just identified and talked about God, pulling him out, got the idols here. He goes, brilliant. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, tomorrow there'll be a festival to the Lord. Yeah. So the next day, the people rose early, sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterward, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. Easy. We'll just merge the two. God won't mind. He'll overlook the idol. He'll be glad for the sacrifice. Right? Yeah. But I wonder if sometimes we do the same thing. 
merger. When God doesn't show up the way we want, how quick are we to question and even go our own way? How often do we find replacement gods, things that we can be sure of, that we can tangibly see, that we can base our security in? Money, relationships, religion even, intellectualism, appearances, our own plans and wills. And we may not necessarily fully walk away from God. We just need added security, right? Something we can see. Something that can go before us. The problem is, it may seem like we're just doing a merger. The Israelites thought they were still following God in some sort of way, just in a different way. But when we choose to disobey God, either merge him with other gods or perhaps pick and choose amongst his commands, we are essentially making something else, sometimes our own selves, God. For God to be God, it has to be complete. That's the whole point of God being God. God is either our God or he's not. There is no middle ground. And that's a fact, not even a stipulation. It just is what it means to be God. In Hosea 6.6, 6, God says, For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. And that theme is repeated. It's mentioned in the Psalms many times. It's mentioned in the New Testament, 2 Samuel, 1 Samuel. God repeatedly says, Don't look, you, you can't replace your love for me, your obedience for me with sacrifices, with what you're doing, with works. I want your heart, I want your commitment, I want your obedience. I want to be your God. Verse 32 of I don't know what actually, I haven't got it written, but so I'm going to put it up here. No, it's not. I'm reading it to you. Verse 32. Moses comes down the mountain, sees the people worshipping these cows. I'm paraphrasing it, that's why. It's chapter 32. He sees these idols at the foot of the mountain. He gets there and he breaks the tablets. Now, this isn't just a... Oh, de- <clears throat> It's an actual, chosen, thought out break. At the foot of the mountain is where that covenant was initially made. As he walks down the mountain, he observes the people having just broken it, and so he breaks those tablets symbolically in front of them. He doesn't just drop them, because the covenant is broken. There is judgment. The choice is given. Choose whether you will serve God or not. No, God doesn't come in riding and slay them all. He is so gracious. He says, okay, covenant's broken. Now you guys have got to choose. Are you with me or are you for me? Choices are made and people do die. They make their choice. Judgment is right there for them. And then Moses intercedes for the nation as a whole and the covenant is restored amazingly the whole scenario is repeated Moses returns to the mountain for 40 days new tablets of stone are given and at Moses' sincere request and it's like God wants him to be very sincere on this very sure he says we really need your presence to go with us Because at first God says, I'll just send my angel with you. I don't think that's what God wanted, but he wanted them to want him. And so Moses pleads, he says, no, if you do not send me, if you don't give me your presence, I cannot go from here. How will people know that we are your people? Come with me, come with us. And God says, okay, 
I will go with you. I will give you rest. I will go before you. And they set out for the land of Canaan. And that is another whole sermon in itself. But my challenge, my encouragement for us this morning is that as we walk some of the difficult wildernesses of life, the lands of in-between that we all face sooner or later, many of us are trudging them right now, as we face these roads, may we not turn to the cows of life, the cows, the idols that seem to be so attractive, seem to give us tangible assurance, but in reality are nothing. They'll let us down every time. May we hold on to God instead. Even when the feeling goes, even when it seems like he's far away, at those times, may we remember his promises, saying, I will never leave nor forsake you. Never. I'm with you to the very end of the age. I am close to the brokenhearted. And I say those who are crushed in spirit. May we hold on to what he has said to us as being true and therefore hold on to him as we walk through these wildernesses. Perhaps, perhaps you identify with the Israelites and cows a little more than you want. Perhaps that has become part of your life. You've You haven't realised you're doing it, but yeah, you've done a merger. God isn't God, God for you. You're going through the motions, but in your heart of hearts, that's something's changed. If that is you, know that God is gracious. The story in here can be yours. Ask for grace and courage and commitment to lay it down, whatever the cow is. He will give it. And like he did for the Israelites, he'll restore a covenant with you. Because he's slow to anger, abounding in love. He keeps his promises for all generations. And you're no different. So I encourage you, don't, don't walk out of here still with a calf under your arm. Let it go. And, And experience that peace of God being God.